Okay, um, this is a concept clearance for a reissue of the re request for applications for the Centers of Excellence in LC Research or the SEER program. And I should note, I'm doing the concept clearance, but the SEER program is a joint program shared, shared across um, the LC staff, which it sounds like will be growing in the future, which is great. <laughs> but Jean McEwen and Nicole Lockhart are also um, involved in uh, shepherding these grants. And Elizabeth Thompson, who I think is still sitting in the back of the room, is of course the, the godmother of the, the SEER program. Does this, does the keyboard work for moving things? Or do I need to use There you it? go. Okay. Good Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the SEER program was established in 2003. It was really based on recommendations that came out of the 2002-2003 planning process. Um, its primary goals are to um, create transdisciplinary research teams that can integrate a wide spectrum of LC research in the behavioral, social sciences, legal, and humanities with genetic and genomic research. Um, the second goal is to actually facilitate the translation of LC research findings into formats that can inform the development of health research and public policies and practices. And finally, um, a very important goal of the Center's program is to train the next generation of LC research researchers with an emphasis on recruiting individuals from underrepresented minority groups. The SEER program uses two mechanisms. One is the P50 or Program Center grant mechanism. Um, it's a five-year grant mechanism. We limit them to $750,000 direct costs each year. Um, the P20 Exploratory Center grant mechanism is a three-year mechanism, which is limited to $150,000 direct cost a year, each year for three years. And the purpose of the P20 is really to allow institutions who don't yet have the infrastructure to support a full P50 Center grant to develop the transdisciplinary and training infrastructure that will allow them to submit a successful P50 application. Um, funding history. So the first, P, uh, the first Sears were funded in 2004. We funded four P50s at Case Western, Duke, Stanford, and University of Washington. And we also funded three P20s at Harvard University, Howard University, and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. In 2007, we funded two new P50s, one of which was a uh, I guess a translation, a graduation of the UNC P20 to a full P50. The other was a new P50 at the University of Pennsylvania. In 2010, we funded renewals of the four original P50s. This would be Case, Duke, Stanford, and UW. And we also funded two new P20s, one at Columbia University and one at the Oregon Health Sciences University, which I think Karen referred to this morning. Their focus is epigenetics. Currently, we're supporting six P50s and two P20s. Um, and this comes to about $6.4 million, which is 33% of the 2011 LC set aside. And I'm not doing that. <laughs> Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please check the number and dial again. I'll call your operator to help you. Um, I should mention that this 33% um, limit was a recommendation that was made by the LC assessment panel back in 2008, and it was subsequently endorsed by council. So we um, keep the, the SEER budget to no more than a third of the LC 5% set aside. Um, there have been um, concerns raised about the SEER program over the years in terms of its value um, and also in terms of its impact on the ability of the ELSI program to fund a really robust investigator-initiated portfolio of grants. Um, but despite those concerns, it actually has 
been quite successful in many ways. Um, it has established very productive transdisciplinary research teams um, that are more and more supporting the um, integration of LC and genetic genomic research. And I think, as Karen mentioned, in fact, the recently funded uh, Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Center grants, um, a number of SEER investigators are serving either as principal investigators, co-investigators, or consultants on those grants. And there are other instances um, with the Pharmacogenetics Network um, and other projects where SEER investigators actually have stepped up and are fully integrated into genomic and genetic studies. Um, as far as translation goes, they've um, provided a lot of just basic expertise and other resources for policymakers. They've um, written policy briefs and white papers at the request of um, Congress and state legislatures. They've provided expert testimony to Congress and state legislatures, as well as a number of federal advisory groups and also the President's um, Bioethics Commission. And they also serve on a number of these groups, either as members or as chairs. And most importantly, the SEERS have really been successful at training a diverse cadre of LC researchers. Um, approximately 80 individuals at the graduate, postdoctor, postdoctoral, and junior faculty level have received training and mentoring through the centers. Um, Many of these individuals have moved on to tenure track positions. And, um, oh, and I should mention that about 30% of these trainees have been from underrepresented minority groups. Um, many of these individuals have moved on to tenure track positions, and several now have successfully competed as principal investigators on their own research grants. So we feel that that's kind of a signature success of the SEER program. Um, the other thing that the SEERS have been able to do by reaching across different departments at their institutions, they've really generated a lot of interest um, and hopefully financial support, though that kind of remains to be seen, um, for this kind of uh, broadly transdisciplinary research. Okay, the RFA that we're proposing now would be um, released this spring. It would have a spring 2013 start date. We are, under this RFA, requiring applicants to identify a clearly defined high priority issue and a related primary <coughs> research project that will really serve as the focus for their center activities. And our hope is to avoid diffuseness of effort in the centers and really to um, help them create a strong center core of research. Um, we will be soliciting both P50 and P20 applications. It is open to all applicants. I should note that two of our P50s that we're currently funding are eligible to apply for renewals under this RFA, and the two P20s at Columbia and Oregon Health Sciences University are eligible to apply for their full P50 grants. Um, but again, I want to emphasize that it's open to all applicants. You don't have to have had a P20 grant application or grant before um, <laughs> submitting a P50 application. We're setting aside $2.75 million in 2013, and we hope to fund two P50s and two P20s. We are limiting the number of grants that we're funding this round to keep the program within the, the one-third um, cap of the LC program budget, and also to allow some future year flexibility um, given the current budgetary concerns. We don't want to make some commitments right now that are going to tie our hands in the future. Um, and that's it, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Length of oh, length of funding. Um, well, the P50s would be funded for five years. The P20s are funded for three years. Um, if, if, one of the, if the P50s are renewals, they cannot um, request a third five years 
of funding. We limit them to just 10 years of funding overall. So if you have a P50, you get your original five years, you can put in for a renewal for five years, and then your funding um, ends at that point. Okay, any questions? Yeah, Rex. Uh, for one, of, if you get one of the P20s at the end of that three-year period, um, what options do you have? You can apply for a P50. We try to time our RFAs so that they're, they're eligible, you know, the RFA is open when the P20s are ready to apply for a P50. Um, if you don't get a P50, you cannot come in with a renewal of your P20. It's a, it's a one-shot deal. Pamela? One just um, informational question, because I'm not sure I understood, and then another question. Um, so you dropped the funding to $2.75 million for the coming year um, because to keep it in line with only being 30% of the LC budget. A third, yeah. And pre a third. And previously it was 6.4 million. D did the budget drop that precipitously? That oh. No, I, I, I should <laughs> say, I mean, we're, this, and I, I'm going to show you another slide, but this is going to be confusing, and I'm not sure I want to explain it. Okay, this is the Sears funding timeline. So if you, if you look, um, Hey, Joy, why don't you, because they're going to lose you on the web okay. if you're not near a mic, and that way you can point. Um, so uh, they, they continue, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get that slide off of there, because right. okay, it's so. confusing. <laughs> no, 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 I get it. All right, so um, my other question, really, is, is a comment. Um, and that is that I am fairly familiar with the training activities at Stanford and at University of Washington. And mm -hmm. I just want to comment that I'm extremely impressed at the work that those two centers have done. And, and well, perhaps the other two. I, I just don't know them as well. Um, I'm amazed at the people they've turned out. They're all excellent. They've gone on to amazing jobs. They've got incredible publication records. This is an effort that is very, very exciting to look at. Um, and it has taken them the amount of time, you know, it's coming to fruition now in the seventh year. Right. And I understand why they're not being funded again. I understand the principle behind that. I don't have a problem. Uh, not that it would matter if I had a problem, but the point is that I would hate to see that training um, organization lost. It, it's so much effort went into building that and they have been so successful that um, I would just put that out there if there's any way to discuss something different going forward that would be important because it is a pity to, to lose and, and they will lose it and I understand they're supposed to pick up their own funding and I understand all of the concepts that go along with this but what they're doing at both of those places is really really impressive. Yeah something that we have talked about is doing a T15 program for LC research which is something we've never done in the past because there was never really a an infrastructure, a cohort of, of strong enough research centers that could support something like that. So that that's something that we will be exploring. And Karen, did you want to? I just say wanted something? to add in, um, maybe Joy, you want to talk a little bit more about what we've now put in place in order to continue to track the trainees over generations and uh, uh, some sort of an infrastructure also that they can collaborate and support one another, both in their trainings and post training. So did you want to just say a little more? Um, we've, we've actually um, are instituting a series, well, each of the centers has a web pages and uh, has a web page. And we're um, standardizing the information on the trainees and the alumni trainees across the center web pages to encourage them to get in touch with each other and to maintain contact with each other. And we'll be tracking them as they move forward in, in their careers. And I should say that's been one of the really nice things about the trainees. Every year associated with the annual investigators meeting, we have a trainee workshop. And the trainees really do um, network 
and you know if, if one trainee is successful getting a K99, they share their application with the other trainees, and there's just a lot of a lot of exchange and, and interaction. Amy, um, thanks, Joy. Can you say a little um, something about the R the P20s? Um, because it seems like this is a three-year grant. The purpose of it is to then build to a P50, although, as we've seen, only one of the P20s has turned into a P50. It's a relatively small amount of money per year. To, and So can you say a little something about what the P20 centers are supposed to be doing during that P20 time and how successful they've been and sort of the pros and cons of going forward with that mechanism of, of, right. sort of easing people in? Right. Um, I should say one thing. Um, as far as the original three P20s, only two of them applied for P50s. The Howard University um, Center did not. Um, the P20, the, the successful P20s, I think what they do is they really start to bring together the people across the various departments at their institutions to build um, trust across the disciplinary borders. Um, a lot of them, you know, hold seminars. They do, a, you know, use a number of different mechanisms to kind of create that. Um, and they also have done some pilot projects, some pilot research work that really sets the stage for the work that they'll do um, when they come in with a P50. I don't know if Elizabeth or Jean want to say anything more about that. I can't, I can't hear you, Elizabeth. Well, I think that um, I was involved in both the P20 and the, the P50. I, I, I think that the P20 did help us basically form a community um, that was nascent at the outset, but um, was really formalized and, and enhanced by that. So. I, it is a relatively small amount of money, but the upside of that is it's a fairly small amount to spend. Also, right. So. The other thing I should say is that the UNC um, P50 Center, when it got its P50, boy, it was out of the blocks really fast. They've been extraordinarily productive. And so I think having the P20 really allowed them to kind of jumpstart their P50. I think that's true. Yeah. Pearl? Thanks so much. Um, I also agree that these are very important programs to keep going, and I realize that it hasn't been going that long and is not that big. But seeing that you're going to fund two P50s and you have two who come in again, some up for renewal, and then if there's a new person or a new entity coming in, are there any lessons learned on how best to select the programs in that, I think, what Jim just said, you know, you, you got a nascent group of people together. If you don't have that nascent group, I mean, what is the institutional commitment? Have you learned enough as to, of the successful programs, what was there before you went in? What right. is the degree of institutional um, requirements even before you plop a P20 or a P50? You know, the thing that we found um, makes the most difference, and I'll invite uh, Jean and Elizabeth to comment as well, is um, when the centers are located within an institutional structure, either a bioethics department, a department of um, history and you know, ethics, you know, what, whatever the department might be, I think that's very helpful and it, it gives them some structure to begin with. The other thing that um, seems to make a difference is centers that are located at institutions that actually have an active genomic research program of some kind. Um, that seems to make a huge difference in their ability to really function as a center. Yes? My, my, my hand was up. Oh, I'm sorry. No I'm problem. sorry, David. I've had my light on a couple times. Um, a couple questions. Um, we've talked about the great training we have done, and that's wonderful, but, and you just mentioned there was an infrastructure tracking. Mm -hmm. um, do you know now anything about, you know, how many, what's the, the long-term sustainability? How many of the trainees have gone on to other types of grants? How many have gone on to R01s? So, I mean, so what markers of success are we really using? Right, actually, we, we do know um, the 
trainees that have gone on to get their own uh, research grants. And I don't have the number in front of me, but I think it's six or seven are actually now currently um, principal investigators on their own grants. Um, and I would, I would hazard a dozen, maybe 20, have gone on to tenure track positions. Um, a number of them have actually gone into the federal government and are working in related fields in the federal government. Um, you also hinted that there might have been, maybe criticisms might be too strong a word, but the, you know, not everyone has been happy with the program and there's been some mm -hmm. debate about it. What have been some of the major criticisms and how have you responded to them over time? I think um, there have been a, two different kinds of criticisms. One is that it really, uh, the center's program takes away from our investigator-initiated portfolio and also creates kind of a, a closed set of elite researchers that um, is, you know, discourages other researchers from kind of becoming involved in LC research. It's perceived that they have an advantage in getting R01s and, and other research grants. Um, so there are those kinds of criticisms. And then there are the criticisms about the program itself. Um, and I think the primary criticism has been that the centers in the past have sometimes been a little bit diffuse. Um, they haven't maintained a tight focus on you know, the single issue that they've identified as a theme. And there's also been some concern that some of the research the pilot projects generated haven't gone through you know, a rigorous review process of some kind. And that's why we're, we're crafting the new RFA in such a way to hopefully address some of those concerns. Um, as far as it taking away from the investigator-initiated budget, I think the thing to keep in mind is that the centers at this point are limited to $750,000 direct costs, which is about the size of a big R01. So it's not, it's not a huge commitment of funds. Um, the time length is longer than most R01s, but the funding itself is not that huge. Thanks. Sure, sure. Michael? So if being at a place with a strong genomics emphasis is perhaps a predictor of success, is, it, is that something that you talk to potentially interested people about? Is it something you encourage? Is it something you nearly require? What, what, what should be the situation there? It, that's a good question, too. It's something we encourage, but we also leave open the door for people to collaborate with these programs at other institutions because we don't want to narrow the field such that you have to be at a big institution with a genomic research program. But, but you do encourage that kind of collaboration across institutions if there isn't a presence there? Absolutely. Okay, good. Absolutely. Thank you. Jim. So you had mentioned that you expect um, the applicants to identify a clear high priority focus, which makes sense. It, will you be crafting the RFA in such a way as to define some of those that you're interested in, or is it more to see what bubbles up? I, I think some of that gets to the issues that, that um, Karen brought up about, you know, being various tensions, very legitimate tensions about where funding goes. Right. Um, what, what our plan is, is we will encourage researchers to take a look at the four um, program areas that were identified in the 2011 strategic plan. And we have on our website a list of high priority research topics associated with each of those four areas. And we will reference the website and, and encourage them to look there. But we also don't want to um, prescribe to them. You know, and ge genomics is changing all the time and we want to leave the door open for people to come up with creative new ideas or identify an emerging issue that we just haven't seen yet. Pearl. One fast follow-up. Um, you had mentioned that you're looking at the possibility of some T mechanism mm -hmm. for the sustainability of those that are phasing out. Would that impact the budget of new P50s or P20s? Would that come out of the same 33% pot or not? No. Okay. I mean, that, that's a good question. I, I, I hadn't envisioned it as coming out of that same one one-third of the budget, but maybe we need to revisit that as well. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, 
it's a concept clearance uh, that is required to have a vote from council. So I guess we'll just do this by show of hands. Um, all in favor of approving the concept clearance? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.